Good afternoon, everybody. This is um, this is Paris speaking, the International Energy Agency, and uh, welcome to this webinar where we will uh, uh, present some uh, conclusions and findings from one of our more, more most recent reports uh, called Tracking Clean Energy Progress. I am uh, Marcus Vroke. I work as the uh, head of the Energy Technology Supply Unit um, here at the IEA. I also lead the Energy Technology Perspectives Project. And with me in the room I have uh, the two lead authors of this report, uh, Justine Garrett and Davide D'Ambrosio. Um, I will be uh, doing a few introductory remarks about the report and the methodology and then uh, Davide and Justine will take you through uh, the more technical aspects and findings of the report. So um, this work was first released at the Clean Energy Ministerial meeting in New Delhi uh, in April this year. It's one of the uh, uh, major inputs that the EIA gives to the uh, Clean Energy Ministerial and uh, that meeting itself has become a, a forum to advance clean energy goals and, and we try and support that a, as much as we can. Um, and this particular report provides a, a snapshot of current progress in, in clean technology. Uh, we give policy recommendations technology by technology um, and sector by sector. Uh, and as you'll see, the, the progress in most areas is actually uh, alarmingly slow uh, when compared to the targets that we have in our two degree Celsius scenario. So if the world wants to realize the uh, agreed goal of limiting long term climate change to two degrees Celsius, uh, progress in clean energy need to, uh, needs to accelerate fairly, uh, fairly rapidly um, and significantly across a, a range of sectors and technology. Um, but also there are positive examples as you'll see and, and we'll make sure to, to mention uh, some of them as well. Uh, first, just a few housekeeping issues. Um, you'll see on your console, hopefully, uh, that you'll have the possibility to write questions. There's a field there for questions. Please use that opportunity during the presentation here. Uh, there will be time uh, after our talk to, to address at least uh, a majority of these questions. We'll do our best to, to answer all of them, of course. Um, so please use that and don't wait until we're done. Uh, write those in as we go. Um, I should also mention that this, this work is a result of the efforts of, of many uh, staff here at the IEA. Uh, we in the room here are only uh, a fraction of, of the team behind the report and we have a range of experts. So if we are not able to, to answer the questions that you have today, we'll make sure to pass them on to, to others uh, in our team and, and get back to you as soon as we can. And of course also do take a look at our, our website. You see a uh, see link up on the screen here. Uh, there's much more data including interactive infographics that, that we hope you find useful if you, if you look at. So, before we go into the, um, to the details, let me just spend a few uh, words on the uh, methodology uh, that we use and why we do this report. Um, this, this work is, is a spin-off, if you wish, of the larger undertaking of the Energy Technology Perspectives Project. And what you see on the slide here um, are the emissions trajectories um, under the business as usual or what we call the six degree scenario that's the top of that wedge chart, chart that you see and the two degree pathway that's the bottom line in terms of carbon emissions from energy related activity and the wedges in between of course are our view on what the contribution in terms of emissions reductions from different sectors could or should be in order to put us on track for this two, de two degree trajectory um, and what we do in this work is we track progress in each technology against the targets um, in these different uh, scenarios. We do this across uh, different dimensions. So we look at penetration of technology, so how much of wind and solar and, and uh, electric vehicles and so forth there are. 
We'll also look at market creation, so how quickly are markets scaling up, what policies are in place to, to speed up the deployment uh, of technologies, and also what are the specific technology developments, so how quickly is the performance of different technology, uh, technology or technology areas advancing, and how does that stack up to the, to the performance that we believe is required in, the, in our two-degree scenario. Um, so, so critically, this report highlights some policy actions that we believe are necessary to, to take in order to accelerate the, um, uh, the progress in different areas. And I'll, I'll right now hand over to Justine Garrett, who will uh, speak to the first uh, half of the presentation. And then David D'Ambrosio will take over and, and speak to, to the second half uh, around these findings and policy recommendations. So, so with that, uh, please go ahead, Justine. Thanks so much, Marcus, and I'll, I'll start our technology-specific findings uh, with the good news today. Yeah, next slide. Um, so renewables, renewable power technologies continue to beat expectations, and they're broadly on track to reach our two-degree or two-DS targets. So it's important to note that renewables alone are not enough to do the job, but what the success shows is that with sustained and strong policy frameworks, new energy technologies can be developed and penetrate the market. So we can see that government action can, can make a real difference here. So growth in renewable power technologies continued in 2012. We saw, for example, from 2011 to 2012, that electricity generation from solar PV grew by an estimated 42%, and wind by 19%. Now, this growth builds on strong performance in 2011, with total renewable power generation up around 6% on 2010 levels. These figures are particularly impressive because they follow a decade of similar growth and also because there was ongoing economic and industry turbulence in 2012 in the renewable sector. So the renewable energy uh, uh, industry entered a deeper phase of consolidation in 2012, especially amongst smaller and high-cost manufacturers. What we've also seen over the last year is that markets are expanding globally as emerging economies step up clean energy efforts. Now, this is very positive. So we saw countries such as Brazil, China and Indonesia uh, as amongst governments to increase incentives for renewables over the past year. So if we take China as an example, uh, that country introduced measures to facilitate grid connection of distributed solar PV systems in 2012. They also introduced a target of around 10 gigawatts of new solar PV for 2013. So despite these positive developments, we did see globally in 2012 investment in non-hydro renewables decreasing in the order of around 11 percent. Now, we attribute this in part to policy uncertainty and stop-and-go decision-making um, in reducing that, that investment level. So to be clear, at US dollars, um, $240 billion investment in new renewable power plants in 2012, and, and we exclude their large hydro projects, that level investment is still in line with 2DS targets. But the 2012 developments that drop in, in investment levels shows that the direct link between, um, or shows that there's a direct link basically between effective policy design and private sector investment. So just to give an example of what we mean by uh, stop and go decision making, um, in uncertainty in the United States, for example, uh, regarding potential expiration of a wind generation tax credit slowed wind capacity investment. And then that's quite an obvious slowing there. So in terms of our messages for, for government policymakers, um, we, we see that these developments show that transparent and predictable renewable energy policies that take into account changing market conditions and also technology cost development are essential to keeping renewables on track. So to sum up on renewables on the whole, and despite the investment slowdown in 2012, we see that renewables are progressing well. And yet, the global energy supply is not getting any cleaner despite these developments. So together with the tracking report, we launched the IEA Energy Sector Carbon Intensity Index, or ESCI, at STEM4, which we see on this slide here. The ESCI shows how much CO2 each unit of energy that we produce emits. And so really the benefit of the ESCI, or the index, is that it shows the aggregate impact of all changes in total energy supply so it helps us answer the question, is overall energy supply getting cleaner, or are positive developments in areas such as renewables being offset by increased coal use or other developments? So as you can see here, 
The net impact of changes in supply technologies since 1990 has in fact been minimal, with the ESCI line remaining effectively at around 100 there. So what does this tell us? In short, that the drive to clean up the world's energy system has in effect stalled. And this was despite much talk by world leaders and a boom in renewable energy over the last decade. Basically, the average unit of energy produced today is as dirty as it was 23 years ago. At the same time, if you look at the numbers down the bottom of this slide there, we see global energy demand and related emissions increasing at a rapid rate, so in the order of around 45% each. So the key reason that the SG has remained static is that coal continues to dominate growth in power generation. Look up to get the slide to forward there. There we go. So growth in coal-fired generation has far outpaced growth in generation from non-fossil energy sources for over a decade now. So we're talking in the order of around 45% growth between 2000 and 2010 for coal-fired generation, compared to growth of around 25% for non-fossil energy sources. And if you look at the line, the two lines at the top of that graph there, you can see how the, the comparative shares have been developing since uh, since 1990 and, and more remarkably since around 2000. We've seen global coal-fired generation increase by an estimated 6% just in the last two years, and, and this is projected to increase to around 17% above 2DS levels by the year 2017. So at, at that level of growth, we, we're actually seeing a path that, that outstrips even a six-degree scenario trajectory. Now, dependence on coal for economic growth is particularly strong in emerging economies. So we're seeing in China, and to a lesser extent India, uh, that coal continues to play a key role. Um, coal, yeah, we're seeing coal um, demand, or well, those countries playing a key role in, in demand growth. So China's coal consumption represented around 46% of global demand in 2011, and our Indi India's share was at around 11%. Uh, what's interesting that is that this is not just a, a developing country story. So in 2012, we also saw demand for coal rise in OECD Europe as excess coal on the market saw prices fall. Now, to sum up, these trends really represent a fundamental threat and the most fundamental threat to a low carbon future. In addition, in 2011, around half of coal-fired plants that were built are using inefficient technologies. So where we are deploying coal, we're not even deploying the most efficient coal technologies that are on the market now. Now, this tendency is offsetting measures to close older, inefficient plants in countries such as China and the US. So in 2011, for example, China closed 85 gigawatts uh, capacity, and the US closed around 9 gigawatts in 2012. So I think these efforts mean, mean little if we're then building new coal plants that are, that are using inefficient technologies. So what can governments do about this? Uh, our recommendations are that, that we really need strong government policy action to counter growth in emissions from coal-fired generation. Um, so what we mean by that is stronger CO2 emissions reduction policies that need to be strengthened pollution control measures, and also policies to reduce generation from less efficient units, so to try and accelerate the closure of those the more polluting units. So I think it's fairly clear that the strong upwards trend in coal deployment shows that despite the progress we have seen, current policies are largely insufficient. So that's in terms of coal, but what then about uh, the, the revolution in unconventional gas that we've been hearing about the last few years? So switching from coal to gas is a key measure to reduce emissions in the short term, but it's by no means a panacea. Gas becomes high carbon in a low carbon scenario from around 2025. And you also have to look at the global picture. So regional market dynamics, and in particular fuel price, which we see here on this slide, play a very big role, and, and they vary considerably. Um, and and the, the difference in prices really means that we're seeing quite d uh, divergent trends in, in uh, gas deployment and, and coal to gas switching. So you can see there, while prices were fairly uniform up to around 2009, uh, for the last few years we, we've seen quite a divergence with Japan LNG costs up the top there, looking at around 16 to between 16 and 18 US dollars, right down to uh, you know, up around well, on, up to uh, around two for the, the US Henry Hub uh, spot price. So based on these prices, so far coal to gas switching is largely a US phenomenon uh, as the boom in unconventional gas extraction has kept gas prices low in that country. From 2011 to 2012, we saw gas fired generation increase by around 24% in the US, while coal-fired generation decreased 
uh, coal-fired generation decreased by around 14%. So we are seeing an effective switch in that country. At the same time, in Europe, and this is partly because of cheap U.S. coal exports, so all that extra coal that's not being used in the U.S. is now going into the international market, but it's also thanks to relatively dear European gas prices, we saw the opposite trend. So from January to June 2012, gas-fired power generation dropped by around 15% in Germany, 12% in Spain, and 33% in the U.K., and conversely, coal-fired generation grew in those countries by 8, 65, and 35%. Uh, respectively. So we're seeing the opposite trend in Europe. So uh, carbon policy is one factor that can influence competition between coal and gas. There are a lot of market factors, including price, that, that does the same thing, but governments can influence that by, through the introduction and uh, through use of carbon policy. So it goes without saying that in regions where gas prices are high, high carbon prices are needed to stimulate coal to gas switching. And it's clear, very clear, that current prices are not high enough to drive the switch. So just to give an example, if we take Europe, uh, an estimated carbon price of around um, 50 euros would be required to drive a short-term coal to gas generation switch. Now this compares to a carbon price uh, of around uh, 4 euros that we saw in early February of this year, and I believe that price has in, uh, in fact decreased since then. So moving on to nuclear. We also see nuclear playing a substantial role in decarbonisation of the electricity sector in the 2D, 2DS, or the 2 degree scenario. And, and we see um, nuclear generation reaching around 16% 16, 16 sorry, of global generation by the year 2025. So in, in terms of what we've seen over the last few years, um, since the Fukushima accident in Japan in 2011, we have seen the nuclear policy landscape starting to stabilise. So for example, last year, construction began on seven nuclear power plants. And that's an increase on the four construction starts that we saw in 2011. These numbers are still down, however, on, on the numbers we saw pre the Fukushima accident. So um, in 2010, before the accident, there were 16 new builds that, that commenced construction. Another development of the last year is that we've seen safety evaluations conducted after the Fukushima accident uh, come to a conclusion. And generally, these have found that existing reactors can continue to operate safely if safety, upgraders, uh, if safety upgrades are implemented. We're also seeing public opinion uh, improving in many regions. And, and just generally in terms of deployment targets, most countries uh, have retained nuclear targets, um, or the same nuclear targets that they had before the accident um, in the last few years. Although there are some important nuclear countries such as France and Japan that are continuing to debate their nuclear energy policy. So basically what that means is that um, we're still seeing several countries with active or planned nuclear expansion programs. Despite this, we see that major additional construction is needed to meet 2DS targets in terms of nuclear deployment. So uh, since the middle of last decade, we've seen around 2.4 gigawatts of global capacity being added each year. Uh, this compares to around 16 gigawatts of annual capacity additions required up to 2020 in a two degree scenario. Now this might sound like a, a big expansion, but if you compare that uh, to, to the historic high in capacity additions that we saw uh, in around the mid-80s, and you can see in the, in the bars in the left-hand graph here, uh, those capacity additions reaching above um, 30 gigawatts annually. So that, that level of ambition is by no means unrealistic. Uh, so in terms of what we see will, will be required to decrease, uh, sorry, to increase nuclear deployment, um, we, we recognize that we still need to, to have further work done on, on public acceptance of nuclear energy. And also, to, in order to drive those investments, we need more favorable electricity market mechanisms and also investment conditions. So that's it in terms of power generation, is the snap that we've seen. So in a world that continues to rely heavily on fossil fuels, and it's very clear from our analysis that that seems to be uh, likely to be the case for the next few years, CCS deployment, so carbon capture and storage deployment, is ever more critical. But CCS still seems to be waiting its cue from governments. In total, we see that there are now nine projects under construction. But in 2012, eight projects were cancelled, and projected ca capture rates remain well below 2DS goals, with a maximum projected capacity at around 25% of the required capture rate in 2020 for a two-degree stabilization scenario. Now, given the long lead times that are required for, for CCS projects, it's unlikely that we're going to be able to, to catch up on that uh, differential there, so around 75% in the next eight or so years. 
Now this somewhat gloomy picture is really despite CCS technologies being mature in many applications and also signs of commercial interest in, in technologies from industry. So we are seeing some green shoots of, of interest from uh, industry. So for example, we saw construction begin on two integrated CCS demonstration projects in Canada last year, so in 2012. Uh, the result of the commencement of construction on these projects is that um, project spending or spending raised on, on CCS demonstration increased by one third on 2011 levels in 2012, so or by around US 2.6 billion. This brings cumulative spending on CCS demonstration projects, the money that's actually being spent on getting those projects up and running uh, since, or oh, sorry, over the last five years to around um, 10.2 billion US. And that includes government grants of around 2.4 billion. Now, this really represents a significant increase on 20, uh, 2009 levels. So, if you see in the graph here, a big ramp up of spending on, on CCS projects, on cumulative spending, is what we show in this graph. So, around an additional 12.1 billion of public funds has also been awarded to other demonstration projects and R&D, uh, and these are projects that are not yet in construction or operation. So, it's money that's been notionally flagged towards certain projects, but it's not actually yet. Um, being sent on breaking ground. So how do we move CCS forward? Uh, we think that governments need to make a really um, or a real long-term commitment to CCS, and that includes in energy intensive industries such as cement and steel. So we're not just talking about power generation here or CCS on coal and, and uh, gas-fired power plants. We're also talking about uh, energy intensive industries and our analysis suggests that around 50% of emissions reductions from CCS will actually be in these sectors. So what does real term or a real uh, long-term commitment to CCS actually mean in terms of policy support by government? We see that this uh, means more support for demonstration, so additional funding, and also increased financial and policy support for deployment beyond first wave projects, so some targeted uh, incentive mechanisms to try to bridge the gap between those early projects and projects that, are, that will be driven in the future by a stronger emissions reduction policy once CCS becomes more competitive. So I think government policy action is particularly critical for CCS, given that, C that CCS is motivated solely by climate change. So there's no co-benefit to undertaking CCS except for climate reasons. So with that, I'd like to now hand over to my colleague, Davide D'Ambrosio, who will talk us through uh, transport industry and building sector development. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justine. Let's now look at the end use sectors. Um, in particular, the transport sector, we see a big window of opportunity uh, in the sector. Fuel economy improvement holds the greatest potential to reduce fuel consumption and emissions in the road transport from now to 2020. This map you see on your screen shows where the potential is to bring fuel saving technologies to the market. The average fuel economy improved by 1.8% per year since 2008. But this is uh, still below the 2DS goal of 2.7 annual improvement. And the pattern is uneven, we have to say, because fuel economy of new cars varies up to 55% across countries. So this shows that the enormous uh, scope of improving efficiency through policy. Fuel saving technologies are generally already commercially available. The challenge is to bring these technologies onto the market. And this is not only about car, cars. Uh, there are still only a few countries with fuel economy standards for heavy duty vehicles. Fuel economy will also rely on more fundamental engine, engine advancements. It is encouraging to see signs of a breakthrough in the market for hybrid vehicles which can form a bridge to electric vehicles. Hybrid vehicle sales uh, exploded in 2012, growing by over 40% to more than 1 million units. And hybrids are now among the top five selling models around the world. Sales of electric vehicles grew even more quickly, and they doubled from 2011 to 2012, even though starting from very low levels. These trends are globally on track to deliver 2DS targets by 2020, and government targets are in line with our 2DS scenario, which is very good news. 
However, the auto industry production forecasts for 2020 are only 20% 20 of government targets. And these targets are not being translated into real action. Our projections uh, say that advanced vehicles will need subsidies for the next decade as costs continue to fall for elements like batteries, which have already been cut in half since 2009, thanks to publicly funded research. And we predict that somewhere around 2020, these cars will be competitive on the market without uh, targeted incentives. But until then, whether for electric or natural gas vehicles, we must incentivize the optimum rate of infrastructure deployment to both prepare for and support the growth of those new engine technologies. Now let's take a look at uh, the biofuels. Global biofuels production has been less encouraging in 2012. In the two-degree scenario, biofuels meet over 6% of global transport fuel demand in 2020 with electricity and hydrogen. But growth in production stalled in 2012 due to high feedstock prices, reflecting extreme weather conditions in key producing countries. For example, the drought that compromised the U.S. corn harvest. This highlights the vulnerability of conventional biofuels production to feedstock price volatility, and feedstock accounts for 50 to 80 percent of total production costs. It is encouraging that the advanced biofuel sector added about 30 percent capacity in 2012, but biofuels production must more than double by 2020 to reach the two degree scenario targets. This will require governments to implement dedicated policy support for advanced biofuels and additional R&D and production funding to enable large-scale deployment. While a number of countries have implemented biofuel blending mandates and targets, few countries have put in place targeted policy support for advanced biofuels. Let's now move on to industry. As in the transport sector, energy efficiency remains a largely untapped resource in industry. We call it the hidden fuel at the IEA. Just using existing technologies would give impressive savings in the order of around 20% of industrial energy consumption, and even more in sectors such as cement and chemicals. Several regions scaled up policy support for industrial energy efficiency in 2012 including Europe, Australia, South Africa, but more effort is needed. The IEA is a strong proponent of market solutions, but we also see many non-economic barriers to energy efficiency. This builds a strong case for regulation to tap into the potential we know is there. In industry, governments must implement policies to ensure that new capacity is developed with best available technology and promote refurbishment projects. In the building sector, building codes have a strong positive impact if designed correctly. Improvements in the thermal envelope of buildings and other building envelope enhancements account for 17% of reduction in energy consumption compared with the 60S in 2020. Today, only Denmark, France, and Tunisia have best practice building codes in place. To achieve deep CO2 emissions reductions in the building sector, governments must enforce stringent performance-based codes, promote renovation of existing buildings, and set minimum energy performance standards based on BATs. There was some movement in this regard in 2012. For example, in the EU's Energy Efficiency Directive and the UK Green Deal. But globally, far more action is required to reach required energy and emission savings. This year, we also included a section in the report that looked at progress in uh, systems integration. 
This included smart grids, cogeneration, and district heating and cooling. This reflects the importance of improved systems integration and flexibility in the clean energy transition. Demonstration and deployment of smart grid technologies is intensifying, driven by forces such as growth in electricity demand, use of electricity in transport, and accelerating integration of large-scale variable renewable energy sources. This is starting to generate experience that can be repl replicated and built on for future projects through initiatives such as the Global Smart Grid Federation. Tracking progress in smart grid deployment remains a challenge, however. There are many individual smart grid technologies, so determining quantitative, indi quantitative indicators and metrics to assess progress and identify gaps remains a key priority. Improved data collection is essential. Reaching 2DS targets will require accelerated investment and new reg regulatory and business models that enable sharing of smart grid costs and benefits. This reflects that cost reductions enabled by smart grids do not necessarily fall in the same sector in which investments are made. In this year's report, we had also a special feature on research and innovation, in line with the focus of the 2013 Clean Energy Ministerial. Total public RD&D investment has increased by 75% since 1990, bringing it back almost to the levels of the early 80s. However, energy's share of total public RD&D has fallen from 11% to 4% since 1980. But what does go to energy is going more to renewables and less to fossil fuels. Last year, almost 20% of energy RD&D was in renewables, up from just 5% in 1990. If governments are serious about transforming the energy system, it is clear that energy research must get a higher priority than it does today. Energy RD&D spending in the OECD has been generally decreasing as a share of total research budgets over the past 30 years, as governments have preferred other areas of research such as health, space programs, and general university research. Our analysis shows that public investment in energy needs to at least triple and in advanced vehicles and CCS much more. Public RD&D is necessary and it works. A few examples are solar in the US and wind in the Nordic countries. So taking the developments across the energy system together is difficult to paint a positive picture, which you can see it's summed up here in this slide. At the same time, the positive progress in renewable energy demonstrates the very real power governments have to create markets and policies that accelerate development and uptake of clean energy technologies. The potential of clean energy technology remains largely untapped but governments can unlock that potential through effective government policy and by pricing energy appropriately. Several of the most promising trends in clean energy are also coming from emerging economies, precisely where demand growth has been drawing carbon emissions. That is great news. Our report makes a number of broad global recommendations that pull together the key outcomes of the report. First of all, it is only by working together among countries but also with stakeholders in the private sector and non-profit world that we can make progress at the scale and pace required. This means deepening international collaboration on clean energy deployment through joint, actionable and monitored commitments and setting clear and ambitious clean energy technology goals. Second, for too long we have supported directly or indirectly, wasteful use of energy. Largely, this is because prices do not reflect the true cost of energy. Altering this means creating a meaningful carbon price and phasing out of fossil fuel subsidies. It also means implementing long-term predictable policies that encourage investors 
to switch from traditional energy sources to low carbon technologies. While that may not happen overnight, let's not fool ourselves. If we do not get prices and policies right, the transition to a clean energy system simply will not happen. The third message is that we need to take a systems perspective and a long-term view. Governments must think beyond individual technologies and electoral cycles and consider the larger picture. Smart infrastructure investments that enable system-wide gains make sense and clean energy solutions such as electric vehicles and solar PV depend on them. But infrastructure takes time to build, so action is needed now. Our fourth message is that we need to seize on energy's easy win, energy efficiency. We have seen that much energy efficiency potential remains untapped due to barriers such as high upfront capital costs, consumer indifference, and lack of awareness or capacity. Stronger economic incentives and more ambitious regulation, including building energy codes, fuel economy standards, energy management in industry, and other energy efficiency measures are required to tap into that potential. Our final recommendation relates to the report's special feature, energy technology, RD&D, and innovation. Early deployment is vital for learning and cost reduction for more mature technologies. But the strategic RD&D is also critical to bring promising clean energy technologies to the market. The private sector will not act on its own. Governments must accelerate RD&D support for clean energy and double its share in public budgets to enable cost and performance gains that make clean energy competitive. This is all about the report. We also want to suggest you take a look at our two of our upcoming publications. One is the Medium Term Renewable Energy Market Report, which will come out on June 26th. And the second one is Transition to Sustainable Buildings, which is also part of the ETP series together with uh, Tracking Clean Energy Progress, and which will be presented on June 27th with a webinar to which you can register at that link. All right, thanks uh, David and thanks Justine. Um, that brings us to the um, questions and answer section here. So we've got, we've got, uh, got loads of questions coming in. Uh, please continue uh, to send them in and even if we can't uh, respond to them now, uh, we'll try and get back to you um, afterwards if, if um, yeah, if, if, we, if we don't have time to do it now. So um, uh, I'll start with a with a I guess the the top level general one that we got on the on that index that Justine talked about the ESKI, the Energy Sector Carbon Intensity Index. Um, whether that doesn't hide the regional differences and and um, if we could say something about how how this index differs by region and and that's um, indeed the case. You know the the global value. Uh, does mask some some important uh, differences in trends when you look at the country level or indeed even the regional one. And first of all, I'd like to point you to the to the website where you can actually go and do this for yourself. There's an interactive infographic on the website where you can go down uh, to the country level and look at how the ISKI has developed and download the data. Uh, but just to give you a flavor of that, uh, if you look at the OSD region, for example, in most cases the the carbon intensity um, hasn't, in fact, decreased uh, by between, say, 5 and 15 percent over the last uh, 20 years, whereas in the non OSD region, we have the uh, opposite trend in many places, so the intensity of the, of the supply of energy is increasing. Um, however, there are some interesting uh, uh, deviations from that trend. Um, in the European Union, for example, we have an increase in carbon intensity in the last few years, whereas in China we see a fairly significant drop back in carbon intensity uh, over the last uh, four or five years. So, so I think it's, it's a very good point that, that you should not just stare at the global value when you look at this index. Um, I think we have a related question on CCS that I think uh, uh, Justine could uh, 
could respond to? Sure. Well, or perhaps, Marcus, I could start with the um, another sort of more general high-level question that we received, and that was whether lack of progress is due to technology problems or policy sluggishness. And I think that's a very interesting question because we certainly do highlight in the report um, areas where the two-degree uh, scenario relies on, um, or, or 2DS targets actually rely on technology development and, and different technologies coming onto the market. And so what we, what we try to do in the report is highlight those areas and then provide our recommendations for government and also industry on what they need to do to try and get those technology areas up to speed and, and uh, to, to be commercialized. But I think more generally, and we, we highlighted, highlighted this at the start of um, our presentation today, uh, is that industry takes its cue from government. And I think the, the developments in renewables really show that where industry is given um, strong signals from, from government policy and, and where the right sort of drivers are in place, that, that cue industry, you can actually see these new technologies coming onto the market. And, that, and that's why the developments in renewables are so interesting. So. Um, I think you can see, for example, in, in carbon capture and storage, it's very clear at the moment that the government just does not have those triggers in place to, to, to queue industry, even though we do see some commercial interest. We're not actually seeing that, that government policy is there to, to give um, industry enough incentives to, to be moving those technologies forward. Uh, to give another example, um, coal. It's very clear that the government policy at the moment is not sufficient to be stemming the, the rise in emissions from reductions. Um, so so that's just, that was a broad question. I don't know, Marcus, if you want to take another one now or if, if I should move on to a couple of the CCS questions that we, we received. Um, so one of the questions we received was whether we have information on, on CCS demonstration in Europe. And I guess I'd like to answer that slightly more broadly and say that certainly in, in the CCS chapter in this report, um, we, we go into detail in terms of the demonstration project numbers that we're seeing at the moment, uh, including uh, well, actually drawing on um, numbers from the Global CCS Institute. And what we did with, with their project numbers that they include in their uh, database is try to assess those across the different regions and, and look at which projects we thought, first of all, uh, in practice are actually likely to move forward, those projects that are in advanced stages of planning. Uh, and also, obviously, those, those projects that are currently in, under construction, so around nine projects. What we then tried to do was take a look at those numbers and say, OK, well, of those projects, which um, rely on enhanced oil recovery, uh, which sort of takes it potentially out of the realm of carbon capture and storage. So can we then look at those numbers and say, well, well what are the realistic numbers that are likely to be contributing to a, re a proper reduction in emissions and contributing to climate change mitigation? Uh, we also tried to draw out then from those project numbers which sectors were missing. So um, you know, we, we are seeing some projects going forward through the project pipeline uh, across various industrial sectors, but there are other sectors that where we, we know we're going to have to reduce emissions uh, where we're not actually seeing projects at the moment. So we, we don't include specific de detail on, on regional um, deployment or demonstration uh, within the report, but we certainly draw on all regions to, to try and provide a, an accurate picture of, of where we're seeing demonstration project numbers are going at the moment. Um, so just a related question, we also received a question um, as to what happens if CCS is not developed in time. And uh, I think probably we see an answer to this more in our energy technology perspectives publication rather than the tracking report itself. So in, in the ETP two degree scenario, if we uh, don't have CCS in power, we see that um, we have to use dramatically less coal, and, and that's the biggest thing about CCS. I think we often hear people saying, well, CCS is not progressing, or you know, that that's that's bad, but actually that has very serious ramifications for, for our practices at the moment in, in energy supply, and in particular the way we're still relying on coal um, to, to meet that, uh, that growth in demand. Um, but in addition, CCS also has ramifications for gas. So if, we, if we're not deploying CCS, we can't just sort of switch to gas and assume that's going to be fine, because as I mentioned before, once we get to around 2025, gas in a low carbon scenario uh, becomes high carbon, and that's when you need to start looking at CCS in terms of gas. Uh, so if we don't have CCS, or if CCS is de deployed uh, late, we also need significantly more nuclear. And again, that, that provides a problem in, in the situation that we're seeing at the moment, where while not all governments, um, uh, well, while there was a bit of disruption after Fukushima accident, things seem to be on track, but we still need a, a big ramp up in terms of new builds. Um, we'd also need development of solar CSP, which again, at the moment, we're not seeing in sufficient numbers. We need more R&D uh, 
for, for that to, to proceed. So finally, I think if CCS is not developed in time, where we're really in trouble is in industry. Because in a lot of industrial sectors, CCS is really the only feasible option to, to see a significant reduction in emissions. So that there's really no easy answer to that. And I think uh, the answer is that we really have to start seeing CCS deployed and see governments taking uh, that, that seriously uh, if we're going to, to reach a two degree scenario. So Max, over to you for some more questions. Um, yeah, thanks, thanks Justine. Um, I think on a related note, um, I think we have a couple of questions related to role of gas and the role of gas versus coal and the competitiveness of those and what kind of coal technologies are currently used. Uh, no, David, could you, uh, could you perhaps spend a few minutes on, on that, on those questions? Absolutely. So for regarding natural gas, the role we see in the, um, in the medium term and in the longer term is quite different because in the medium term, up to 2025, we see gas playing a key role in decarbonizing the energy system, uh, especially by replacing coal. But after 2025 and 2030, gas will be the dirtiest fuel, hopefully would be using and uh, at that point we'll need to start dismissing the use of gas quickly to go toward more clean energy uh, power generation. How can we help gas be uh, more competitive uh, versus coal? Um, so as we uh, as Justine explained during the presentation, we need policy action in this regard because with coal so cheap, gas will, will, will be very difficult for, for gas to become competitive. So in, the government should introduce carbon pricing to push for change from, for, for gas to go switching, coal to gas switching. We received another question on which inefficient coal technologies are used in Europe and if the low prices are the main reason for the extensive use of coal. So right now, the great majority of coal plants are subcritical, which is the most inefficient technology now available compared to uh, ultra supercritical which is only a fraction of the overall uh, capacity. And this is not only due to, uh, to gas and coal prices, but also it's due to the technology lock-in effect, because once a coal power plant is built, it takes easily 25 to 30 years to have a return on the investment. So we can't simply dismiss a coal plant because it's dirtier than other coal plants. We also received an interesting question on um, data collection. If IEA is a central point uh, for global data collection or if we rely on uh, decentralized collection agencies, the there is no right answer for this, but um, we have direct contacts with all of the OECD governments and they all submit uh, and fill and submit question, data questionnaires on the different uh, uh, fuels and sectors which are analyzed and collected by our energy data center. For non-OECD countries, we have direct contacts within governments. For example, we have uh, ongoing collaborations with Russia and China. And at the same time, we do research to fill in for the countries where we have no contacts. It is also important to remember that IEA uh, plays a big role uh, to increase transparency and to harmonize energy statistics around the, around the world, uh, two initiatives that um, were initiated by IEA 
are the Joint Oil Data Initiative, which collects oil uh, statistics on a monthly basis and involves the both producing and consuming countries, including OPEC. And another important initiative is Interenerstat, which brings together many international organizations with the aim of harmonizing the way energy statistics are collected and reported. And if you want to take other questions. Sure, thanks, uh, Davida. Okay, well, I have one here um, asking whether, well, in response to what we said on nuclear, aren't European countries moving out of nuclear altogether? Uh, now, I think we did see sort of immediately following the Fukushima accident, um, some countries choose to phase out nuclear um, by closing down or not extending the lifetime of existing plants. So to give an example, a high-profile one has been Germany, uh, but we also saw Belgium and Switzerland take that decision. So collectively, those three countries represent around 30 gigawatts of nuclear capacity. But as I mentioned uh, when I was discussing the, the nuclear findings, um, really the, the policy landscape is stabilizing and it seems at this stage that, that virtually all other countries are, are retaining the policies they had prior to the Fukushima accident um, and that many countries are in fact planning an expansion of nuclear. So I did mention the exception, however, of um, the, the French government. We're talking about Europe specifically. Uh, now, France, in 2011, uh, nuclear electricity represented around 80% of generation, so it's very heavily uh, nuclear generation-based energy system here. Now, there's been discussion at the moment of reducing that share of nuclear energy to uh, around, or down to around 50% by 2025. Um, the, the government in France has also scheduled closure of the, of the country's oldest plant um, that's due to occur in 2016. So I think that just to, to give a snapshot of, of what's happening in Europe and, and although I think the, the high profile has Germany, um, the high profile example of Germany has perhaps sort of created the impression that the governments are moving away from nuclear policy, that, that's not really the case. And I think the, the key challenge in this area is actually that while we are seeing an expansion, we need to see a significant ramp up of that expansion. So that, that's our key area of focus on, on nuclear in the report. Uh, so that's the nuclear. We also had a, a question going to transport now uh, in terms of tracking modal shifts in transport in the future as opposed to only developments with uh, road vehicles. So we do um, focus in the report on fuel economy of, of road vehicles uh, and also the development of electric and hybrid electric vehicles and what, what we're seeing there. And actually, as David outlined, we're seeing good progress in, in EVs uh, in particular. But we do also mention in the report, and we have a box on this, um, the growing importance of understanding urban mobility and modal shifts in transport. Uh, and, and basically, in the last decade, we've seen um, global transport energy use increase by around 30%. So, so this is becoming a, an increasingly important, important area. Um, we've seen related emissions grow by nearly 2 billion tons of CO2 equivalent over that time. Um, so I think this growth uh, in, in energy use in the transport sector really has a considerable impact on how, how you move people and goods efficiently around because obviously there's a lot more movement, so that has implications for, for how we actually move people and, and goods. So the, the difficulty is, and, and this is the reason why we haven't included a dedicated chapter on uh, modal shifts and, and urban mobility in the report, but only uh, sort of a text box, is that um, there's very limited understanding at the moment of, of urban mobility trends um, and, and the data uh, on urban mobility and transport energy use is actually quite limited and this is an area we've been trying to work on here at the IEA but um, that it will require I think a lot of global collaboration uh, and, and what we say is that we need dedicated policy support for analysis of urban mobility and that includes uh, funding for studies of travel behaviour and choices. Now, the difficulty is with some of these mobility surveys that we're seeing is that they're very time consuming to prepare, first of all. And second, the, the design and scope is often a bit limiting uh, in terms of the value they can bring to helping understand the impact of travel choices on energy use and also related emissions. So, for example, surveys will often define a trip according to the principal means of transport taken from the starting point to a final destination. And that doesn't actually consider then the other means that people use to get to and from the principal travel mode. Another shortcoming is that 
um, mobility surveys often expressed a share of trips performed by travellers giving um, used giving a trans, uh, given transport mode. So, for example, let's say 25% of trips are taken by bicycle or walking, but that doesn't actually equate then to 25% of total distance travels or 25% of energy consumed, depending on the sector. So, so this is an area we looked at in the report, but uh, it's one that we're acknowledged um, that the governments need to, to try and put a bit more uh, effort into. Marcus? All right, thanks, uh, thanks, Justine. I'm, I'm conscious uh, of a time here, so um, I think we'll, we'll try to wrap up uh, in time for the one hour mark. Um, and again, do, don't hesitate to send us uh, an email or, or get in touch on by other means. Uh, we'll do our best to answer your questions there. There's just a couple of final ones that I want to address though before we before we leave you. One is uh, we have a, a few questions related to technologies that we haven't talked about. You know, geothermal, ocean, um, uh, the role of biomass in the long term, and so forth. Um, of course, this report is is very focused on the near term. So uh, the reason you know geothermal is a good example, ocean as well, and technologies there where we, we do see a great potential for those, especially in certain regions, uh, but they're not as apparent in the, in the short term. Um, so, so don't take this as a message, uh, just because we haven't talked to them in the, in the, over the next decade, we don't see a role for those technologies. And there, I would like to point you to, uh, to for example, the Energy Technology Perspectives publication, also the medium-term report on rivals that uh, David mentioned before, that's coming out next week, it's got numbers, for example, on geothermal and ocean as well. So I highly recommend the, those uh, um, those reports. And finally, we have a question uh, related to how this how this report relates to, for example, the buildings book that we are releasing next week as well. And I, you know, put simply, I guess the the buildings book and, and other sort of sectoral books that we release, in a way, describe how to get back on track. Um, how to make sure that we can accelerate technology uptake and development in a sector like the building sector, for example, so that we do uh, that we do see a, a pathway consistent with uh, with a low carbon trajectory in the two degree uh, scenario. Um, so, so this this uh, project is very much a, a complement and a and a way to to make sure that we follow the reality in relationship to our scenarios. Um, so, so again, do uh, do register to those. Uh, to those webinars uh, that you see on our website so you can follow that work as well. Um, so with that, thanks a lot for attending. We've had a lot of people here, lots of good questions and apologies for those of you who, who did not get your questions answered, but um, uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll talk to you again in the near future and, and we can uh, continue the discussion of these issues. So thanks a lot and um, have a nice summer for those in the Northern Hemisphere, that is.